So welcome back. I think people are still starting to join us and we will kick off in a, a minute or two. Okay, well, I'm delighted uh, to kick off the next session. So welcome back, everyone. Um, and we're going to be exploring the whole um, issue of achieving inclusive education using AI. Um, I think inclusivity and inequalities are certainly one of the issues that the ethical framework really does try to address. And I'm delighted that we've got Otalandu Durawoju joining us today uh, to speak to this. and. Tunde is, um, he's a reader in education management and he's the Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion for the Faculty of Business and Law. And Tunde is also a very active member of the Alt SIG, um, Anti-Racism SIG. So um, a very warm welcome Tunde, delighted to have you with us today and really looking forward to seeing how you're going to uh, cover this really, really important topic of inclusive, inclusivity and AI. So welcome. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Natalie. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for uh, joining us today. I think, um, as um, Natalie said, yes, I'm from um, Liverpool John Moores University, um, and I'm the sort of Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion. Uh, and, and part of that is looking at how we ensure that, our, that us as a faculty and all LGMU as an institution um, is, you know, very, very inclusive in, in what we in what we do. And AI presents a, a unique opportunity. And we've been sort of looking at how to explore um, using AI as a means for achieving um, inclusivity. So what I'll do now is very quickly just share my um, presentation um, and then we can kick off. So just bear with me a second. Uh, I hope you can see the presentation. I'm hoping you can see the presentation. Uh, yeah, we can see that perfectly. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. All right. So uh, my topic um, today is around achieving inclusive education using um, artificial intelligence. And I used a statement, um, a disadvantage, uh, where at, at, at Dow because I, I believe that when we talk about inclusion, one of the things that we need to address are the um, disadvantage risks that um, uh, is involved. And if you look at the picture um, in that um, PowerPoint slide, it's a picture of a, a young girl um, who's um, competing in the vertical jump uh, competition. And what you see first is um, that young ladies being sort of measured for uh, for their height and, and their reach. Uh, and then once they've been measured, they use that height and reach as the baseline for measuring the actual jump performance. So the lady then jumps and then the actual jump height is then measured. Now, what they've tried to do in this picture essentially is to identify what they consider to be a disadvantage risk, and that is height and reach of the competitor because do they believe that there are different competitors with different height and different reach therefore if they are actually interested in measuring the jump performance 
of the um, competitor, then it's important to eliminate those disadvantage risks. And the same um, analogy is what I will sort of use, use when we're talking about inclusion within um, education. So what are those disadvantage risks and how do we level off those disadvantage risks in order to ensure that what we are actually uh, performing, uh, what we're actually measuring is the actual performance of the students so there isn't any disadvantage and we ensure that there's equity and, e and equality in what we are measuring because what we find right now in most higher education institutions is we, we what we do right now is we uh, measure um, disadvantaged performance rather than just measuring the actual and the true performance of students so we need to be able to address this issue so the problem is how do we then you utilize ai because ai is, is an emerging tool um, that is being used in different um, fields to address what they consider to be important challenges so in the medical field for example it's being used to address you know in, in medical diagnosis it's been used in the physics world it's been used in the creative art industry again to sort of enhance uh, creativity of art artists um, in physics world is being used to solve difficult and hard um, problems now there's a perspective that ai is an important tool to address those important challenges the question then is what do we see AI as a as a tool um, uh, for addressing what sort of problems within higher education? So AI really potentially can be a very useful um, leveling up tool, um, but at the moment it seems that we're still not looking at it from that sort of perspective. We're still not you viewing AI as a tool to address a specific and unique challenge um, for us. But what I'm talking about today really is around how we use AI to address the unique challenge of inclusion. And of course, you just need to read um, literature and you need to just you know, visit some of those discussion spaces and you would very quickly realize that, yes, we've got an inclusion um, challenge within higher education. And some symptoms of that um, challenge it are things like um, awarding gap, where there is uh, a huge difference between the proportion of white students who's, who achieve um, two, one and first class compared to non-white students who achieve the same degree outcome. There's a huge disparity in there. And not just that, another symptom is um, in uh, what, what we consider to be the student experience, for example, the experience of, uh, with um, regards to assessment or even with, in terms of um, employment outcomes. So there are gaps um, in existence. The question is, how do we as um, the university or as higher education sector or even for the education sector, how do we address this issue? So inclusion is an important challenge um, and we need to be addressing addressing that. Now, currently within higher education and for the education, what we currently see is that we've got um, different applications of AI. Um, we've got chatbots. It's been used as um, chatbots. It's been used within assessment grading systems to ease the sort of marking load of um, of uh, academics and, and tutors. It's also been used as an um, adaptive learning systems. It's also been used in the way of them. Um, analyzing huge volumes of, of, of data. But of course, we currently have two classical problems with the current AI. We've got a design of problem, and we also have a design for problem. So with regards to the design of um, challenge, um, we these are some of the things that we already know. We know that, you know, um, we always say be careful. We tell our students to be careful when they're using generative AI and um, because there are um, repeating biases um, in the output of, um, of those generative AI. And that's because generative AI is replicating the bias because the AI algorithm is being trained by um, data sets that were generated. And in those data sets, we know that there are biases in them. And if that is not addressed, what, what AI will then do will be to replicate the um, existing biases. And of course, um, operators within this space, within this market, are looking at ways to address 
um, that um, repeating bias issue. There are, of course, ethical concerns. Um, and again, you just have to listen to the news and you'll see what's happening with regards to AI regulation and AI um, ethics. Bloodlines, of course, between um, fact and fiction, because as we, as a word um, itself entails, generative AI means it comes through the internet, it comes through the data set, and then compiles what it believes to be the best answer um, to, um, to the question that you post to it. And we know that it gets all sorts of data from all sorts of sources, um, and you can't really tell whether what is presented is actual is actually fact or is actually um, fiction. Also, we also have what we call the um, weird lens problem, where most of the output uh, um, you get from generative AI is based on weird lenses. And weird, of course, is the acronym um, used for uh, Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratized societies. And if you if we use Chat GPT as an example, Jack. Chat uh, GPT three um, as of twenty twenty um, had uh, I think around um, the ninety two percent of all the data that is used in in training um, GPT uh, three uh, ninety two percent of that came from English. Um, the next language to that was French, and that was around. Uh, 1.8% and you can see a huge disparity. So we see that it's very, very um, English focused. And if that's the case, then where is that diversity of knowledge that we, we hope um, to get with um, AI? So these are some of the design of challenges that we know currently exist. And of course, we know that there are still transparency uh, transparency issues, you know, um, where is the data coming from? Um, how are they you know, using those um, data, you know, um, hopefully not in a, a malicious um, way. And hopefully, uh, I think if you listen to the news uh, just a few days ago, the EU uh, eventually came up with uh, with a regulation uh, for AI. And hopefully maybe that will start to um, get a people, get people to be a bit more sort of open and willing to use um, AI uh, because the adoption rate worldwide right now for many businesses especially is around 50 percent and of course you can also look at the breakdown of you know uh, by by country um, the willingness um, to adopt AI and also um, whether they trust AI or not and you can see the different spectrum where different countries exist within that um, um within that um uh, a line and you can see that for example the uk at the moment i think um uh the willingness to accept ai still stands around 30 something percent um, but of course we still have a long way to go so if we look at some of those design of challenges, of course, it's something that we need to be mindful of when we're using um, AI. We also have what I call the design for challenges. OK, and this really looks at um, what we're using AI for within higher education, for, for instance. For example, when we when we look at where we apply AI, we mostly design it for the majority. OK, and if we look at the UK context, that would be the white majority. OK, and it's important for us to understand it also in, in, in relation to the minority um, um, part of um, of the um, student body. Also, when we're never we are purposeful about how we use AI, it's usually for a very limited number of um, um, protected characteristics and the one that we typically use it for is around disability and also neurodiversity and that's that's a good thing all right however we also need to be mindful that there are other protected characteristics that also warrant our you know purposeful use of ai and that's some of the things that i would like to sort of focus on um today so often we ignore intersectionality we know that an, uh, an individual all right, might have several disadvantage risks, which we need to be mindful of. But the problem we currently have is that many of the interventions that we have always has that sort of single focus. So it's high time we started to think about the intersectionality of these um, disadvantages. And we'll touch on that um, a bit um, later on. Again, there's still that perception um, within 
um, higher education that you know inclusion means you know treating everybody equally and unfortunately it's still a, a, an issue because i spoke with some people um uh, uh uh just last year and you know some of the things that were coming out of that of those conversation was you know people still think that you know i treat everyone equally you know i can't you know i can't be seen to um, be doing anything extra now of course the problem is not the issue is not you know i'm doing anything extra the issue is being proposal thinking about what are the needs of the various um, student demography uh, within your within your institution and addressing those specific needs that's the key issue here all right and then the last uh, problem that i think or the last challenge that i think we have is what we call is what i call the um the academic limitations or the institutional limitations and what do i mean by that i mean that we've got time limitations as academics or as tutors or as educators and um, we have workload uh, limitations we've got subjectivity and um, limitations whether you like it or not we are all very subjective um, in the way that we deal with things um, and sometimes those subjectivity might not be apparent to us so we've got things around unconscious bias as well um, uh, I, we also have issues around flexibility we also have issues around um, a lack of creativity and those are some of the issues that we currently face and that doesn't give us the space and the capacity to think about inclusion in a way that we can be a bit more purposeful and a bit more effective in how we deal with the issue because if you've got so much on your on your plate and you haven't got enough time um, and you, you, you're not allowed that flexibility that is required in order to address inclusion issues, then, then that issue would remain an issue and it wouldn't be um, addressed. And that is why it's important for us to think about how we lighten the loads in this particular area. And AI presents a unique tool that can help us as um, academics or as tutors or as ed educators to reduce the burden of time the burden of workload um, by improving our workflow and also improving our productivity and hopefully with that we would have enough space and enough capacity to be able to be more intentional about how we use our roles to achieve inclusion all right in in our education so uh, as an institution where are we okay can we actually achieve inclusion um, using AI so where are we as, as an institution unfortunately um, I think we're still not where we ought to be um, and, and this is a provocation uh, and that is most of the policy around AI really is geared towards you know um, handling students use of AI um, for example chat GPT so it's either we've got a policy in place that says oh no you can't use um, uh, generative AI at all or ones that says that oh yeah you can use it however you need to reference the fact that you have used it so there are different um, uh, um, interactions with with AI again it depends on the specific um, university but unfortunately again most institutions within I uh, within the UK and of, of course around the world still um, have not issued any policy whatsoever on the use of um, generative AI um, and that needs to to improve the second status is around our current view of academics of tutors and of educators we've got this omniscient view of them where we expect them to deal with new technologies as they emerge to uh, train themselves and to address the problem uh, and because yes we do rely on educators but we tend not to think about the toll the challenges that educators are facing for example inclusion that we're talking about it sometimes you've got certain um, um, academics that are very active when it comes to inclusion but when you ask others you know it's not an issue for them they, they don't even think about inclusion all right we we had an interview um uh, on staff's perception of them um, of inclusion um just um, a, a couple of years ago and some of the things that came out of that interview was that you know some staff don't even think about inclusion when they're designing their curriculum and and in this day and age it's important for us to to um 
to think about what we're doing, who we are teaching. We need to know who our students are, all right? And, in, and, and then hopefully we can be a bit more sort of effective in, in, in that way. Therefore, as, as, as institutions, what we currently do is right now we're still very hesitant with regards to AI and, and that's, that's, that's understandable, but we need, to, we need to do a bit more. Uh, and we also need to um, help develop the capacity of the academic to be more purposeful in with regards to how they use AI and not just how they use AI, but how they use AI for, for inclusion purposes. So as an institution, we need to recognize that we've got limitations, all right? And we need to be able to overcome this um, uh, limitation. So AI can help us address some of those limitations that we, we uh, that, that I talked about, workload um, and productivity issues. We also need to understand that it takes time and effort for an academic or an educator um, to be able to get to the point where they are sort of confident enough to be able to utilize AI, all right, in the learning spaces. And of course, um, institutions, for example, like UNESCO, are coming up with framework um, that um, institutions can use to help develop that agency um, within educators. And I think it's very important to sort of read up on that and, and follow through on that. We also need to develop um, a multi purpose in other words we need to use ai that can address several challenges at once and then we also need to use a sort of multi narrow ai strategy so it's not just using for example chat gpt within your um, institution it's, it's about how you use that collection of um, ai applications for example chatbots adaptive learning how you sort of use them um, in a sort of effective and, and sort of combined way and that's where we need to be as as an institution so if i also ask everyone here today that what is your ai use plan what would be your response will it be that okay right now we're just talking about policies on you know or on how we help students to sort of um, uh, um, use um, generative AI, or will I hear something a bit more purposeful, a bit more sort of further down the line than that, and saying that okay, we we've adopted a, you know, specific technologies using AI, and we're training our staff in the use of this AI, and and so that they can hopefully pass that knowledge um, on to students, and also help students to um, use AI in a safe and in a very engaging way. So that's a question that we need to, to address. Now, if you look at the picture on the, on the right-hand side there, um, in order to develop a, an institutional AI strategy, there are three things that I think are uh, completely necessary. Uh, the first one is we need to adopt a utility view of AI. In other words, AI as a tool, okay, how can we use AI to address some of those challenges that we've got? Secondly, is we need to recognize the agency costs, okay? Because we've got this reliance on academics, but what can we do to help academics to be able to get to the place where we need them to be in order to help address or to further the AI um, uh, and inclusion agenda within, within our institution? So do we need to have training in place? Do we need to pay for training, all right? Um, if they're going to go for training, do we need to include, factor that into their workload allocation, for example? Do we need to make space for them and time for them to be able to, to do that? So those are some of the things that we need to sort of think about. And when we're talking about AI, there has to be a, coordinate, a coordinated use. So it's not just about using just one type uh, application or one using AI to solve one task, it needs to be solving multiple um, tasks for us. For example, we use chatbot, for example, in engaging students. We use generative AI, for example, in the learning spaces. We use adaptive learning, for example, uh, when students can sort of go away, go home, and then hopefully catch up with uh, maybe the lesson of the day or, or, or help them to learn at their own pace. So those are some of the things that we need to uh, think about, and it has to be coordinated, and that's very, very important. So how do you develop uh, an AI use plan? Uh, first thing is you need to understand your context because when we're talking about AI for inclusion, uh, remember you are addressing the needs of people, all right, of humans, and you need to know what those needs are. So understand your context. And then secondly, would be to respond using AI. So it's, it's, a, it's a matter of 
thinking how AI can help you to address some of these issues. Um, and, and that's very, very important. So if we look at understanding your context, what that means essentially is you need to be able to collect and analyze the data that you've got. Okay, um, so think about the demographic data that you've got. So things around gender, ethnicity, disability, religion, sexual orientation, area of deprivation, and even those that don't come under what we call protected characteristics. And if you look at OFS, for example, they've got, they've come up with um, um, this um, equality of opportunity risk register that can also be useful. So it's, I would say that it's important to sort of engage with those um, um, registers to so understand how, um, other forms of um, deprivation, you know, can be factored into what we are addressing as, as an institution. But more importantly, we need to understand the intersectionality of these um, disadvantaged risks. Okay, so understand that. And then secondly, look at your performance data. So what we did also at LGMU was that we looked at um, the performance of the various student characteristics. And we also did a, a survey trying to understand the experiences of this um, student um, characteristics, just to, to get a better sense of some of the challenges that they're facing. And in order to then think about this, the um, bespoke solution um, in, in, in order to sort of address um, some of those issues. So it's very, very important. I, I would say this is one of the most important aspects of um, achieving um, inclusive education is to, to know where your students are coming from and understand what sort of disadvantage risks um, 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 they, they've got going on. And then hopefully once you've done that, then you can then be a bit more purposeful about how you use AI to respond to those operational um, issues. For example, how do you use AI in curriculum development? How do you use AI in assessment delivery or assessment strategy? How do you use AI in outside hours engagement? Um, uh, and how do you use it in a sort of adaptive learning format? And of course, lastly, you need to think about intersectionality. Um, uh, there's a TASO report that came out recently looking at um, uh, reviewing um, two different interventions around decolonizing the curriculum and they found limited evidence that the decolonization um, decolonizing the curriculum interventions didn't have much success in addressing the awarding gap that I spoke about um, initially. Now there could be several reasons for that but that again it's a pointer towards trying to address a specific disadvantage risk and then um, and then not thinking about the intersectionality of all of this um, disadvantage risk and how that impacts on the awarding gap. And that is why being purposeful and intentional is very, very important. So what I'll do very quickly now is just go through each of these and, and talk about, give you just an example of how you can achieve um, inclusion using um, the uh, um, um, uh, in curriculum development and, and the other um, boxes that we've got here. Again, these are just examples the point here is for you to think about how you use it in all of this area all right in a very targeted um, way so for example in curriculum development you can use it to sort of pluralize perspectives on a particular topic for example if i was to um, i teach um, supply chain management uh, for example and i also teach management theory so if i say okay i can tell my student to say to use generative ai to come up with you know, five different aspects of management theory. They do that. And then I can then say, all right, how do we pluralize our knowledge of this topic? I can then say, all right, use specific prompt, okay? That asks the generative AI to look at perspectives from maybe, for example, an African point of view. So when you start to do that, you start to get concepts around things like Ubuntu, you know, uh, togetherness and, and things like that from that sort of Af um, African and cultural um, perspective. And that just enriches the knowledge of our students, okay? So that's one way. Another example could, would be maybe to ask it to generate a reading list. I remember the previous, um, the, the, in the previous session, they talked about um, the use of um, a, 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 a library. And it's very, very important. When you ask students to do this, it's important for you to ask them to verify. And that's one additional thing that they can do, you know, to improve their learning, to say, this has been generated by um, uh, generative uh, AI. Are these 
list actually in existence and they need to be able to go and then verify um the those um those lists and then they can hopefully um use um those lists so that's just two simple examples of how you can use um ai in curriculum development in an inclusive way the second one is around assessment delivery um so formative assessment for example um, or, or low stake marking and using it as a sort of feedback mechanism for, for students. Um, and what you will find is that this also is very useful, for example, for um, international students who are not very familiar with, uh, for example, some of the criteria that we've got or some of the language that we use in, in the assessment brief that we give them. So this hopefully would help them to, 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 to learn more and familiarize themselves with those, um, with those criteria. So, an example of this would be you could encourage the students to um, use the um, GAI to grade their own submission. So you've given them a task, grade that submission using the set of criteria that, that you're using in, in your module. And hopefully once you've done that, then they can then start to improve on the work because the GAI can then give them specific feedback and they can then use that feedback to sort of improve their work. OK, or you can get students to improve the quality uh, of their response through prompt engineering. OK, um, and, and then you can then see how their responses get improved over time. OK, so that, again, can be very targeted and it can be very informative and, and educative in, in, in that way. Um, uh, and then assessment for learning. Again, you can provide students with a set of marking criteria and get them to mark sample responses. So this, these are different ways of them um, operationalizing that um, and get them to mark sample responses that you've marked already and you know what the um, answers are and then they can then interrogate you know the difference between the marks that you assign them and the marks that um, chat gpt and hopefully through that they can then see where those improvements um, um, need to be made also, you can also use it in outside hours engagement. One thing we learned from the survey that we, um, from, yeah, from the survey that we did, um, was that students typically, when they've got issues with within their modules, they typically don't go to the module leader; they go to their peers, and some actually also go to their family members in order to address some of those issues. So, what we're saying is, in a very inclusive way, and the reason why they don't typically go to many of those um, academic tutors it, it could be for fear that if they went and asked a question the tutor might think that they are stupid okay and that might leave a, an impression on them so therefore they avoid going all right uh, it could just be again the language that we use we always say oh yes you are at the university or maybe you're a master's student now you need to be able you know you need to be able to do things on your own and independently so Again, that also makes them um, a bit um, apprehensive about approaching uh, their um, academic tutors to be able to answer the questions that they have. So one way of um, taking the, that piece of information to them might be you know, through chatbots, all right? Um, and it could be as simple as just converting some of the FAQs to a conversational AI style um, and, and product. And it can address things around assessment information can also help you if you use it in a targeted way um, to be a bit more transparent about your assessment criteria and what you're grading and help you to remove the hidden curriculum that we know exists in, in, in many um, assessments. Also, it can also help the students to know more about the module, all right, module information. Also, when we're talking about induction, and I think this is a very big area because when students come to us, we always give them a lot and lots of information. So if we have a chatbot that can help them um, to understand and digest the um, information we're passing to them, I think that would be very, very helpful. It can also be used as a um, student self-evaluation um, in terms of writing. So for example, things like Am I Right or Grammarly? And we know that um, language is a huge um, disadvantage risk for many students. You can also use it in adaptive learning and I've put examples there, for example, Cogbook, Macro Hill, Connect, Can Academic, uh, etc. Um, lastly, um, think intersectionality. So how do you use, for example, chatbots, generative AI in a way that addresses multiple disadvantages or disadvantage risks for example example of those disadvantage risks would be english language proficiency so that could be an issue that affects for example um, um, neurodiverse students 
or international students or students whose first language is not um, English. Again, it can help. You can also look at how you address, for example, cultural gap. Um, you can look at things around anxiety, for example. Uh, for example, um, when you um, we know that um, um, students have higher level of um, anxiety when they attempt exam types of assessment. So how do we use AI to sort of um, um, to, to move away from uh, exams? Um, also in terms of um, uh, diminished capacity, for example, we have students who are sort of um, caregivers. So which means that rather than have five days in the week for studies, they've got diminished number of days compared to those who don't have care um, uh, 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 care um, responsibilities. So how do we help bridge those gaps? So those are some of the disadvantages that we need to think about when we are um, thinking about um, using AI within our learning spaces. So where do you go from here? Think about an intersection you want to prioritize. So we're not just talking about one disadvantage risk, we're talking about multiple disadvantage risks and how you can use AI to address all those dis disadvantage risks. Uh, consider the challenges that we've been talking about and, and the limitations of the use of AI. And that's very, very also, that's also very, very important. And of course, we need to develop that instructor student um, partnership um, approach. Um, prepare yourself, engage with your institution diversity and inclusion plan, you know, participate in reciprocal um, men mentoring, um, trying to understand things around race and also around, you know, diversity, uh, utilize research that has already been, been undertaken by different institutions. There are several toolkits in existence, try and utilize them and see how can I use that and marry that with my use of AI within the learning space. And of course, get involved with various staff networks. And the one that I would recommend is the um, anti-racism uh, in learning technology and uh, special interest group of, um, of ALT. And how can you get involved in that? Uh, you can be involved as an ordinary member, or you can, um, we've got um, officer positions are available at the moment, um, or you can just show interest and uh, to join as an officer, and then we'll keep you um, in mind going forward, or you can join us as a speaker. We're always looking for speakers um, around, around this. So it's a space for a real um, change and to make a, a real impact. So these are some of the things that hopefully once we prioritize them, um, we can then start to look at achieving um, uh, inclusive um, education. So I'll stop sharing for now. I think that's the end of my presentation. Um, how, how, how are we doing? Yeah, that's yeah. great. Thank yeah. you so much, Tundra. That was that was a bit of a tour de force, I think. Um, really, really important points, but also some really helpful practical examples. So many thanks for that. So we'll go into questions. Um, and okay. the first one is from Maria Walker, who's saying, can we trust AI not to pluralise perspectives from a stereotypical point of view? That She's asked it to write a case study about a fictional African company and it had no depth. There was no real representation in the case study. So is, is there almost, you know, um, something we've got to be aware of that we could ask, you know, be using it in that way, but actually there could be drawbacks at the same time? Yes, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Because um, when you when you ask a, um, generative AI to, to sort of answer some of those questions, sometimes you have to be. We said you have to be careful because sometimes you you can't separate facts from fiction. But what we are hoping will then happen with the student is that it then you know puts that sort of investigative mindset um, in, in into play, and then they then go and then research some of those information that was sort of turned out by the generative AI. And that's that sort of extra step that you need to, to take. Now, what AI can do is that it can bring up different concepts, but the student then needs to go and then think about researching a bit more ar around that. And the idea really is just to make sure that we're not just teaching them concept from one point of view it's about pluralizing you know the various perspective from that so there's no one perspective that is right or universal all right so it's getting the students to think about multiple um, perspectives sorry i can't hear you apologies 
Sorry, I muted because there's a bit of hiss on the line. Yeah, I was just saying, yeah, and that brings in all the critical thinking that we've been talking about in the earlier session. So it's an yes. opportunity then to reinforce developing, developing that AI literacy, isn't it? Yes. Um, there's a question there from Chris Rowell. Can AI be anti-racist? Can AI be anti-racist? I, I think that's where the design for um, comes into play. I mean, the design of challenge comes into play. So if we are a bit more intentional about um, how we design AI, we talked about the output coming from um, uh, from this sort of weird, weird, that's an acronym, weird lenses. Um, and when we think about those that are involved in the design of AI, how diverse are the, is that team, all right? So when we start to think about how we design AI in the first place and who's involved in the design of AI, then we can start to use that sort of anti-racist lens in developing in developing AI. And I think that's really crucial. Unfortunately, I think I might be putting my, um, my foot into it now, is when I think about some of the talks around ethics, and I know that's very important, and usually inclusion uh, and anti-racism tend to be sort of subsumed under that. Uh, for me, I think there has to be a separation there. You have to separate because anti-racism is an important component of achieving inclusion. And I think I think a lot of people don't get that, um, but it's important for us to be able to look at it from that perspective and, and say that, all right, where are those inputs coming from? How diverse are those inputs? Remember I mentioned that, for example, ChatGPT, and I'm, I'm not singling out ChatGPT here, this is just the only example that I could find. 92% um, of the data set is coming from English. One point, around 1.8% 1 is from French. 1.4% is from um, uh, German. The next language is 0.7 percent and you can then see all the other languages are less than zero percent uh zero point uh, less than one percent so to, so if that's the case then it means that you know whatever the ai generates will be basically from from that perspective so where is that diversity of knowledge and, and i think that's very important so to address that question i think yes ai can be anti-racist uh, anti -racist, but it has to be intentional Question is, I don't know where that it is at the moment. Yeah, we've only got a couple of minutes left, um, Tunde. I'm going to ask one question, yeah. and, I, and I want to ask you a final question if I can, but I'll go with this one first. Um, and it's essentially, how do we reconcile uh, the issues with AI and representation and its use? It can feel like we are being complicit or supporting that. Would you say the key is to point out its shortcomings rather than boycotting it? Yes, I think, um, and that's why at the moment we have to use AI very carefully. We, and, and we need to, it's important to understand the challenges that come with AI or the challenges that AI itself represents. And we've talked about that already. But it's not enough to then say, all right, we then dismissed the use of AI completely. Um, there are several surveys that have been conducted um, and you, you can see that um, it's been said that AI will become one of the competitive factors for many institutions in the next 30 years. All right, we can then say, okay, there are too many problems. We close our eyes and we say, no, we're not getting involved. But what we what what will tend to happen is then we then let we get left behind. And I think it's very unfair on students because AI represents a very very important opportunity for us to level up. All right, and if we're not sort of using that and thinking about how we can use that despite all the limitations that he's got um uh, I, I think that would be a, a significant missed opportunity and i don't think we as institutions should be doing that mm. and, and a final reflection i noted that you know during covid that some of those inequalities were addressed with that pivot to online and the blended learning approach and we saw attainment gaps narrow and we saw um, BAME groups particularly do a lot better and also disabled students and I remember during that time we did quite a detailed equality an EDI equality impact assessment 
And I, I'm just wondering, whether is that something that you'd recommend that we should be doing with our communities, maybe with that approach that Mary outlined, different, different you know, professional services staff, academics, students together to really work through that so that we can begin to take that responsible um, ap approach to making sure that we adopt AI in an inclusive way. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I think I think the COVID period was a, a very good um, case uh, or uh, a case study for, for, for this, because when COVID hit, what we what we did, basically, we became a bit more flexible. Um, so rather than having in-person exams, we started having, you know, different um, 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 uh, formats for, for our exams. So the question is, you know, we changed the formats for exams and I know we're coming back because of AI as well. We we're thinking, OK, how do we prevent students from cheating? Uh, but what COVID forced us to think about was how do we do things differently? How do we accommodate many of these challenges that our students are facing? But what we then find is that post COVID, um, you know, some people want to go back to the way things that are done. And especially when um, AI sort of ChatGPT hit the market, um, many of the responses were that, oh no, we have to go back to exams, you know? And you just have to look at the historical performance of students on exams. You will see that there's a clear gap, okay, based on ethnicity, based on, 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 on race. And we can't go back to that. So it's very important for us as institutions, as colleagues to sort of come together and think, all right, how can we use AI, just as we did with, um, with regards to COVID, how can we use it, you know, in a, in a very effective way to address some of the challenges that our students uh, are, are known to face. So it's important to, to know what those disadvantages are and how we can use AI to, um, to remedy them or level them off. Thank you again. That, that's been a really insightful talk. And as people saying in the chat, really appreciating hearing your perspective and um, the practical examples you've given. So thank you very much. And um, that is the end of the morning session. We thank reconvene you. at 1350. Um, and I, I maybe just wrap up by saying, um, do think about the old ethical framework. We're really thinking, you know, looking for case studies. And I'm sure that the um, anti-racism learning technology SIG is also similarly looking for case studies. Um, you know, and there is an old award around um, ethical practice. So think about this as you're developing your approaches and in your institutions and the kind of case studies that you could be sharing with the with the broader community, because we're all in this together. We're all facing the same challenges. We've all got that challenge of time and space. We need our collective thinking, don't we, and collective perspectives. So I'll leave that as a final thought, but thank you again, Tundi, also to Helen and Mary, our other speakers this morning, and look thank forward you. to seeing you later on. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for having me.